Hey Nerd Nation, it's Justin from The Credulous Nerds, and I'm back for our daily podcast. I wanted to apologize for not following through with our daily podcasts. Uh, If you've noticed, if you've been following our podcast feed, you've probably noticed that there's only been three daily podcasts in the past week. So I wanted to apologize for that. Um, Just getting up and going and trying to find the right schedule and the right time to be able to record these podcasts has been a little more challenging than I had expected, but I want to commit to you that we'll be doing this daily podcast at least six to seven times a week. So it might take us a couple of weeks to get there, but that's the plan. So back again today is March 31st, 2018, and I want to talk about the the film that just came out over the weekend, Ready Player One. If you haven't seen that film, I definitely recommend going out and seeing it. Uh, this weekend, or you know, as soon as you can, it's definitely worth seeing. I took my family to go see it, and Mark came with us, and we had a great time. It is great to see an IMAX. I would recommend IMAX all the way. There's a lot of detail in this film, a lot of background stuff going on, and in these huge battles, there's a lot of characters, and to have the the bigger screen. To be able to see it in, you know, the high definition on the big screen is probably the best way to see it that way. You'll be able to take in as much as possible. And I still think you'll probably want to go see it again and again. At least buy it on home video to see it again and again because there's just a lot going on in this in this film, which is great. And so we went and saw it last night, and I want to say that it was a fun time. We had a good time watching this film. A lot of people in the theater had a good time watching this film. Uh, there was a five or six year old kid sitting in front of us with his parents and he was just clapping and laughing and even jumping up and down at one point. And it wasn't annoying. It was fun. It was, it was a good time. And there were some people behind us that were laughing and enjoying themselves. And they were probably, you know, thirties, late twenties, maybe. And then on the other side of us, there was a, an older couple, a grandma and a grandpa and they were enjoying themselves. You know, they weren't as animated, but they still were having a good time watching this film. And it's it's a good family f- fun uh, oriented film. There's a, a few swear words, some s words, one f word that actually <laughs> ended up being kind of funny in and of itself. But um, it you know so that's kind of the the tone of the film. It's Steven Spielberg. He directed this one. Uh, It's based off of a screenplay by Zach Penn and Ernie Klein. Ernie Klein wrote the book probably five, six years ago. Definitely recommend picking that up and reading that book. A lot more detail. There's some differences, which I'll cover briefly here. Mark and I are going to do a more in-depth podcast review episode of this film. So stay tuned for that coming out in the next couple of days. But uh, I just wanted to touch a few things and uh, on this film. So, like I said, it's directed by Steven Spielberg. So if you've seen his movies, you know, like E.T., Back to the Future, you know, those Goonies, those type of movies, it has that same flavor, has that same appeal. So if you're okay with your kids watching those movies, then this is right up that same alley. You know, it's the same type of movie, more modern uh, and just as entertaining as those ones. Uh, it's a classic. The music is reminiscent of, of those films from the 80s and 90s. The movie's music is composed by Alan Silvestri. And so he's kind of got that same flavor of those movies we saw when we were kids in the 80s and 90s. So uh, definitely nostalgic. And I, they definitely tried to use the nostalgia factor in this film. But it, it worked. They pulled it off great. I didn't feel manipulated or uh, forced to feel like, oh, I got to like this because I liked it when I was a kid type film. So um, that's kind of the tone of the movie. Ernie Klein, he wrote this book, like I mentioned earlier, uh, five or six years ago. He's come out with another book since then called Armada, which is very similar in kind of the story elements, where it's a teenage kid who plays video games and the earth comes under attack. It's kind of got the the feel of Ender's Game a little bit as well. So definitely check that out if you haven't read that one. Um, they are going to be writing Ready Player Two. At least Ernie Klein will be. 
that's kind of the rumor that I've heard lately. And Ernie Klein also wrote the screenplay for Fanboys, which you haven't, if you haven't seen that, I recommend seeing that as well. Fanboys is a story about some Star Wars fans who are looking forward to the release of Episode One. So it's set in the time period of you know 1998, early 1999, and one of the friends is diagnosed with cancer. So they're gonna travel cross country and break into the Lucasfilm Ranch. Skywalker Ranch, and take a sneak peek at the movie before their friend dies. So it was very entertaining, very Star Wars fan-based, a lot of great moments in that film, but Ernie Klein is the master of 80s and 90s and early 2000s pop culture, so if that's something that you're interested in, definitely check out his work. But I do want to talk about just a little bit about how the book and the film are different, but not going into too much detail. There'll be some spoilers, uh, but nothing too big that if you heard, it wouldn't be anything that you haven't read online or had perhaps heard about. So I'll try not to include too much detail and information, but there are some differences that I do want to talk about briefly. With the film, the, the overall structure of the film is the same as the book. You know, there's Wade Watts, who's, you know, kind of an orphan boy living with his aunt, that type of thing. But he has access to the Oasis, which is this virtual reality world that everyone has access to. Because I guess life kind of sucks in 2045. It's set in the future. So everyone escapes to virtual reality online. And you can play anything and be anybody online. So the guy who created the Oasis, uh, Holiday, he dies and he creates this game where you have to you know pass three tests to get three keys and once you get the third key you're able to unlock the ultimate easter egg and get you know all this money you own the game you know your unlimited wealth and everyone wants to play the game so you'll you'll just keep making money so everyone wants to be the winner and they're called egg hunters people who are you know, actively playing this this game, this treasure hunt. And they shorten the term to Gunters. So Wade Watts, uh, his code name, online Oasis name, is Parzival. Parzival, I guess you could say. And so he's a Gunter, and he wants to win the challenge. So he studies, you know, Holiday's life, all his likes, dislikes, everything he's done, so he can become the ultimate nerd who he kind of already is, but he, you know, studies his hero's life because that's where all the clues are going to be. That's how they figure out what to do. They get in his head and try to figure out what he was thinking and how he left the clues. So initially everyone's playing this treasure hunt, trying to find it. But after five years, still no one's uh, been able to figure out the first clue. So they kind of drop off and not very many people are doing it. And there's this main corporation called IOI, and they are involved in, you know, all this computer programming. So they're making all these um, uh, additional weapons and tools and things that you can buy in the Oasis to help you play the game. So they make money off of uh, computer programming and they're just this big company that they want to recover the, the the ultimate Easter egg so that they can own Oasis. So they're kind of the corporate bad guy in this film. And so Wade Watts and he meets up with this other guy named H and there's this crew of five people throughout the movie. And so this general structure of the film is the same as it is in the book. And there's, you know, the book, you can spend more time with characters on situations and, you know, you don't, you're not limited to this two hour time frame that movies are. So you get a little more explanation, a little more detail and things. And that's probably the biggest difference, obviously, with this book and the film, as with most books that turn into films, the book is usually better, right? So that's the case with this, I would say. And I wouldn't go as far as to say that the book is better because the film is just as good. It's just different in certain places. The film, like I was saying earlier, is fun to watch. 
I had a great time. My wife and my daughter haven't read the book. Mark hadn't read the book. And they were just as entertained as me and my son were who have read the book. So I don't think reading the book or takes away or adds to the the enjoyment of this film unless you let it to, unless you want it to. So there is some negative comments out there about how the film is different from the book and the film ruined the book and blah, 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 all the typical negative stuff that we see online from social media. And I wouldn't pay attention to it. I'd go see this film if I were you. It's it's great. Uh, probably the biggest differences between the book and the film right off the bat is, you know, the different uh, challenges they, they have. There's the three challenges. The first one in the film is there's this race and everybody has to get in their car, get their vehicles ready. And they race this track through, uh, it looks to be Manhattan and they have to race to the finish line, which is Central Park. And no one has ever passed, uh, King Kong, who is the ultimate boss in, in this level. So a lot of people make it to Kong, but Kong beats them because no one can pass them. That's the way the the race is designed. So Wade Watts starts thinking about it, and he talks to this pretty girl whose name is Artemis, and he's able to talk to her, and they both know a lot about Holiday and his life and his likes and dislikes and everything. So Wade, through that conversation with Artemis, gets an an idea. So he figures out how to beat the race and he ends up beating the race. And then Artemis, uh, figures it out as well. And then H figures it out. And then there's these other two, uh, egg hunters, Daito and Sho, who join them. So they become the high five because there's also a scoreboard that keeps track of, you know, who's winning the contest. And for the longest time, no one was on the scoreboard because they couldn't pass the first challenge. So once once um, Parzival passes the first challenge, he takes first place on the board, and then Artemis takes second, and then so these five friends, you know, they they place, you know, they're the first five on the scoreboard, and so in the that's the the first challenge in the film. And in the book, it's different. It's a whole different setup in the sense that the first challenge is you got to find the same thing. You got to find the, the clue to to find the, the the key. And in the book, the challenge is this maze, this dungeon maze, kind of like a Dungeons and Dragons maze. So Parzival figures out where it is. He enters the maze, but then he sees that Artemis is already there, but hasn't beat the maze yet. And the ultimate challenge, once you get through the maze, now we get the maze, is there's an undead king there, and you got to play him in the game of Joust, the old video game Joust. you got to beat him two out of three times. So Artemis hasn't beaten him, but Parzival does, so he takes first place, and then Artemis, uh, actually, Parzival gives her a clue on how to beat him, so then she ends up taking second place. And then H takes third, and then these other two characters... Um, they end up, so the high five ends up being the same. And then from there, they go on to the next challenge, which is different as well. And in the film, the second challenge is the, the hotel from the shining. You got to, you know, f- figure out where to find holiday's old girlfriend. And you got to navigate the maze from the, the hotel, the, the crazy old lady who attacks people. You got to get through her. The hallway's filled with blood. And then there's the two twin girls that are creepy. I mean, they got everything from The Shining in there. And so while different from the book, it's just as entertaining, if not more so. Because there's, you know, you got to navigate this this horror hotel. And so it's a lot of fun to watch. Uh a lot of great scenes in that second challenge in the film. So like I said, it's not any worse. It's not worse than the, the scene in the book. It's just different and just as entertaining. So they're able to navigate that and, you know, gain the key from that. And uh, in the film, uh, Artemis is the one that wins that and gains the key. 
So in the book, the second challenge is that they have to go to this planet that has all of, it's kind of like the suburbs where, you know, you get all these cookie cutter houses that look the same in the same streets and everything. And the houses are all the same. And the house is Halliday's boyhood home. So they all look the same. You got to figure out which one it is. And then once you figure out which one it is, you got to figure out where to go in the house to be able to find the key. And the high five, they're able to figure it out. And what it is, is you go to the house, you go in the basement, and it's a replica of the old video game Zork. And if you've played Zork or heard of Zork, you know that it's a one of the first video games created, and there's no graphics, it's just text. So you gotta tell your your adventurer who's in the dungeon of Zork, you gotta say, go left, you know, go right. And you're just typing in this text. And so if you were to film that, as well as film the challenge of the first one where the guy's just playing a video game, that wouldn't be as interesting as what we saw on the screen. It's still, it's entertaining to read, and I had a lot of fun reading it, but it's different, right? And I think they made the, the right choice to, to be able to come up with something different for these first two challenges in the film. The third challenge is pretty similar. It plays out a little different, but... It's pretty similar in the sense that there's this castle in IOI, the, the the bad corporation who's just in it for the money. They get there first and they put up a force field around the the castle and the crew has to figure out how to get past the, the force field to get the, the last key. It plays out different, but it's still just as enjoyable to watch. And the ending is pretty similar uh, in the sense of how you know, who wins and how they win, that sort of thing. So a lot of good things about this film. I enjoyed it. I'll probably see it again at some point, you know, definitely be buying it on home video to watch it you know, again and again over the next few years. So especially if Ready Player Two comes out, right, you got to watch the original film in preparation for the sequel. So recommend getting that. Mark and I are going to talk more in depth about Ready Player One here shortly so stay tuned for our podcast review of ready player one so i want to thank you for joining me on this daily episode of the credulous nerds podcast and definitely check out our other podcasts on spreaker.com or soundcloud.com you know definitely give us a listen let us know what you think if you saw ready player one let let us know what you thought of that if you thought the book was better or or not Uh, you can listen to the book on audible Uh, Will Wheaton does the narration for Ready Player One. So if that's something that interests you, go to our website, randomangst.com, and there's a link there that you can click on to sign up for a free 30-day trial period, and you can get two free audiobooks on us. And uh, if you decide not to stay with Audible, you can cancel your subscription, but you still get to keep all the audiobooks that you bought. So definitely worth checking out if Audible books are something that that interests you. Also, we're on Patreon.com, and all of our podcasts are there, hosted on Patreon, and you'll find uh, exclusive content on Patreon. Look us up on Patreon.com, become a patron, you know, pay a dollar to five dollars a month. Uh, If you like our podcast, you know, it comes out to pennies on the dollar. If you listen to four podcasts a month with us you know that comes out to 25 cents an episode and hopefully our content and our show is worth at least 25 cents an episode so give us a a try on patreon and uh, get access to exclusive content there so i want to thank you guys for listening and stay tuned for more nerdy content from the credulous nerds as we break down the latest books movies comics and tv shows that we like to watch 